Hi, everyone, and welcome to AB Conversations, where we will help you CFP your way out of it, a podcast where you get into the minds of a couple certified financial planners on how we think and feel about everyday financial planning questions and what should really matter most to you. A healthier financial life starts now. Hey, Ben. Happy podcast day. <laughs> podcast For day us. it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> happy, happy podcast day to you too, my friend. Oh, oh, hopefully, happy podcast to the listener. Oh, to the listener, yes. And hopefully this will be, uh, you know, the last of sweater weather for a while. Yeah, I'm looking forward to wearing a polo. Yeah, there we go. For those, <laughs> uh, for those watching the podcast as opposed on to YouTube. Yeah, 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 there we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we uh, are clearly a financial planning podcast. And I know we we try to stay in that lane, but it is not uncommon for certain people to come to us even if they're looking for financial planning and asking the question, well, do you handle investments or is that something I can do in my own? So yeah. we really thought it would be a good topic today to go through just that question. Can I, or should I manage my own investments? Uh, and maybe give some insight into the things that we would think about. Yeah. So yeah, the, we certainly approach that, as you said, planners first. We certainly work with clients that want to outsource or kind of delegate the investment process to us. And that's great. But that is not necessarily a requirement for us helping somebody through the financial planning process. So just want to throw that right right out right out there off the bat. Um, But for those that do feel comfortable or want to manage their investments themselves, we want to start kind of just with the foundational building blocks of if if that's something you're interested in, then what philosophy do you have to follow? Yeah. Right. Right. Just really foundationally, how are you going to make investment decisions moving forward? How are you going to make the decision between, am I going to use active management? Am I going to be more passive mutual funds versus ETFs, individual stocks, individual bonds, like all all of the now micro details that go into (laughs) managing your investments that I think um, the majority of the time it's through the lens of I like being, you know, caught up on the news. I like to see what my investments are doing. Um, right, you know, maybe right. while I was working, I checked the four hundred one k account, you know, on a daily basis to see how things are going. Some people that is interesting to them, um, and that's fine. I think the other side, a lot of times, it just comes down to, well, I think I can do this on my own. If that means I'm going to save whatever fee that I would pay somebody else to help me manage this, then that's money in my pocket, and and I'm okay just you know, being able to, to attempt doing it myself. But again, I think yeah. that's where that leads into part of our conversation of, well, here's all the other things that go along with that. Yeah. So what I heard you saying in <laughs> uh, just fewer words is you def- <laughs> we definitely want somebody to have a plan for those investments. And part of that, just like when we're writing financial plans is to try to think of the pivot points, right? Yeah. And and that is to say, not just, all right, well, look, I can, I can punch some numbers into a model and it's going to tell me this is how much in stocks, this is how much in bonds. But then it mm-hmm. becomes, yeah, what are the decision points for rebalancing that portfolio? Yeah. What are those decision points for when I need to withdraw some money? What are the decision yeah. points for uh, you know, when the world feels a little crazy as it does maybe on a day like today? when am I going to then be making changes? And that is having some sort of blueprint for that. We call it in the industry an investment policy statement, but it's pretty much giving those guidelines to say, even if I'm doing this on my own, I'm doing it within certain parameters that I'm going to follow. Because I think doing it on your own and not having that means you're being reactive, not proactive. And reactive is where people can make mistakes that we would hope Um, if we're doing it or we're guiding the process that we're keeping people from doing those types of things. Yeah. Yes. And clearly that is our bias as planners, right? Not wanting to go into a a scenario or or down a a, a path of a process without kind of those, those steps kind of clearly laid out a a guideline, a workflow, whatever that looks like um, just to keep you on the straight and narrow. The thought of going through that process, just kind of by the seat of your pants, I, I just, it's completely foreign to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but let, let's not create like a complete bias to, hey, pay right. somebody else to do this. Um, sure. 
I would say magnitude matters, right? Yeah, yeah. The the man the management of a ten thousand dollar portfolio or a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, the magnitude of some sort of mistake is very different than I've got a million dollar portfolio or let's not even put numbers to it. I'm in retirement. This is now my finite pool of money to support me. Right. If I if I make a mistake or I feel like you know I I got emotional about this, you may not have the time to recoup it anymore. So. That, yeah. that is to say, if you have a plan on the front end and maybe you're a little bit younger, just getting started, they're absolutely totally agree that there are do-it-yourself models out there that yeah. will work. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I'm, I'm glad you said that. And even, uh, yes, the, the magnitude, the size of the account and, and the potential downside impact matters, but I'm glad you said it too. It's phase of life certainly impacts that as well. To your point, if it's somebody younger saving for retirement, that theoretically makes the, that investment decision-making process a little bit easier. You can kind of set it and forget it, be aggressive and just let the market do the heavy lifting. Come retirement, or if you're already retired, yeah, that, the, the margin of error is just a little bit smaller where those mistakes can have more profound impacts beyond just the investment account, right? If that starts to affect the withdrawals that you can take, the cash flow that you can um, pull from your portfolio to meet your living expenses that can have catastrophic uh, impacts depending on how you know the 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 situation um, you know depending on if it's you know a loss in an account yeah overreacting to to market news making changes within your portfolio all all of those potentially negative outcomes so I like that you went there because I think you know we can't have this conversation without thinking about the most common kind of pivot point for somebody, and that's usually around retirement, right? Mm -hmm. Where maybe you've maybe you've been investing and you you would deem that you've been investing yourself because it's really just you on a four hundred one k platform, yeah, right? The company provided, but let's explain that. There's usually more limited options, and sure. they're for a reason, because that needs to be monitored, because we need to protect the investor, things of that nature. But then when you have the ability in retirement to think about <laughs> an individual retirement account, this may be the time when we're really asked that question. Do I just leave it in a 401k? Do I move it to an IRA? Yeah. If I move it to an IRA, am I doing that myself? Can you guys handle that for me? I don't know. Maybe we should go through those pros and cons and maybe some of the service things that would go along with that. Yeah, it, it that that is that is one of the the bigger questions. And you said it when somebody retires, you you have the ability to roll your retirement account four hundred one k four hundred three b anything like that to an IRA. And there are a whole host of positives and negatives that can you know in, impact that decision. So right off the bat, the the pros are if you have and this is not uncommon anymore, right? If you've worked for multiple employers over time and you have multiple 401ks, different investment providers, being able to consolidate that into one spot, right? If you're moving that into one IRA, it makes the ease of not only, um, you know, maybe it's the, the cash flow, right? Withdrawal management, but it also should make the investment management side of things a little bit simpler too. Again, if you're looking at one account, managing one account versus trying to manage three or more, um, it's just ease of use and oversight ongoing. Same thing, you kind of touched on it earlier too. Within, a, within a, a retirement plan through work, those investment options are probably limited. And some of that is on purpose, right? But going out yeah. to an IRA, depending on the provider, your, your options may be virtually limitless. And that can, that, that we, we would call that a pro um, in this you know, pros and cons column. If you are going out there and doing it yourself, maybe seeing that the world is your oyster and being inundated with maybe too much choice, I could see how that, that could be both a, a positive and a negative. Um, but I, I guess the, the biggest upside in moving to an IRA is you then do have that ability to hire a professional to help you manage that, where within the 401k, usually do not have that as, a, as an option to you. Yeah, so my mind immediately goes to sometimes the, the question that I think people are trying to answer is not, should I do this on my own or not? I think you... you you said it earlier. Some people may see this as like, I think I would enjoy it. I would like it as a hobby. Um, I think sometimes people make that decision too based on some sort of prior experience. 
you know, oh, yeah. maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe you paid for an advisor and it wasn't good service or it wasn't a good feeling of experience, or maybe there wasn't good communication. Draw, yeah. draw it up whichever way you want, where now yeah. the idea of now I'm going to move it to an IRA and I either pay somebody or I don't. Can I do it on, by myself? The answer probably is yes to a degree, but it, mm -hmm. it goes back to, can you check these boxes of being able to follow some sort of roadmap, keep yourself from making emotional decisions, and mm -hmm. can can you handle all the decision points? And maybe we should talk about those of, yeah, especially in retirement, when I need to get to my money, how do I go about doing it? Yeah. And I mean, we talk about it a lot just within financial planning. When it comes time to turn your investments now into that income stream to help meet your needs, right? Your paychecks have now stopped. How do I recreate that from my, my different accounts? If you just have a retirement account, then there, the decision is, if I need money, I'm going to take it from that account. But if you have different accounts, right? If it's just your, your if you have an IRA, you have a Roth IRA, you have a non-retirement investment account, making the decisions on, okay, well, if I need X amount of dollars a month, where am I sourcing that from in the yep. most efficient manner? Thinking from a tax perspective, thinking from the investment perspective, thinking in the future projection, you know, what am I, what do I want to have later in life? What's the most advantageous? Just all of those little details that maybe we take for granted because that is part of our, our planning process. Um, but that's a, that's a huge one, right? If, and when I need money, where am I going to pull it from? And then yeah. if you need to, gen if you need to generate cash, right, if it's fully invested, what am I, what am I selling at this point in yeah. time to generate that cash? And certainly as we've seen here to start the year, it may feel not uh, it may feel like not a great time to be selling from your stock market investments when the S&P's down, you know, 10, 12% year to date, maybe it makes sense to pull from your bonds in the short term um, because they're not down as much. And these are all like to us, these are like critical decision points. And I, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I do think we probably take that for granted because it's something we do every day. Mm -hmm. um, but to the, to the individual that may be doing it by themselves, there, there may be many unintended consequences to the way that you're going about it. Um, and maybe you don't find that out until tax time. Maybe you'll right. never know about it for investment purposes, but there truly is. I, I, I think of the touch points that you and I have throughout the day that are mm -hmm. not planned. It's usually, oh, we need, we need to create some cash for this person. We need to do this for this person. What do you think? Um, yeah. Because it's not, it's not robotic. There are inputs into that decision that should be talked through and you are weighing. If I do this, then there's this, but if yeah, I do this, yeah. then there's this and you have to make a decision. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think that's the difficult part is that there's usually not a, a clear black and white. Yes, this is good. No, this is bad. It's, it's very yeah. often somewhere in between. And it is to your point, it's, it's weighing the potential trade-offs where one feels maybe slightly better than another. Um, but yeah, th there's definitely a lot of, of factors that can go into just a simple decision as, okay, what am I going to sell right now to take my withdrawal? Yeah. So then let me pivot a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you're, if you're doing this on your own, then we would encourage you to also pay attention to some other, I don't know, checklist items. Um, I'm thinking RMDs if you're of that age. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a, there's decision point then too on not only making sure that you're taking the appropriate amount of withdrawals, <laughs> but yeah, especially I'm going to go one step further. If you have multiple accounts in multiple different places, yeah, this, yeah, <laughs> you, you need to get this right. Um, I don't know. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, yeah. So let me pick that up because it is, that's one that, uh, the, the rules changed not that long ago, right? The age for RMDs used to be 70 and a half and now that's 72. Um, and actually, I don't, I don't know that we had this, this conversation, but at the end of last year, beginning of this year, the IRS updated their actuarial tables for the RMD, the life expectancy tables for RMDs. So there came a time here at the very beginning of the year where if your financial institution automatically calculates your RMD for you, that may not have been accurate at the very beginning of this year because they were yeah. still using the old actuarial tables. 
we, I mean, I know that because I, we, we are tied into these updates. We pay attention to these things because it is our job to know. But if you're just a passive, you know, I can manage my investments, but all of the, you know, the tax changes, the legislation changes, those little details that often get overlooked. We've been in the business for 15 plus years each now. I think you're on 16. And we've seen those changes happen so many times over the course of our, our careers that it's very easy to miss little details that do matter when it comes time to, to managing your investments or withdrawals or RMDs, things like that, that Again, if it's not something that you're living and breathing day in and day out, it's very easy to miss some of those, those smaller changes. Yeah, and we talk about qualified charitable donations from RMDs. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Do you take your RMD at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year? Right. Again, these yeah. are decision points that matter. Um, yeah. Another checkpoint, I'm going down our list now, so sorry yeah, yeah. I'm taking all the good ones. Um, <laughs> if you're going to do it yourself, don't overlook the titling of the account and the beneficiary yeah. designations of the account. Um, yeah. Because while it's fun to think about, I'm gonna manage investments this way and I'm gonna make money and I got all this taken care of, the impact of having improper titling or getting a beneficiary wrong or not updating it. Um, yeah. Man, those are the horror stories that we hear. Yeah, yeah, and, and one, of, one of the simplest ones and it, it just, it comes up from time to time, right? We see it if, and it, it, I'm sure it's going to affect me, right? I have daughters, but if there's just as simple as a name change, right? One of your, one of your daughters gets married and their last name is updated. It, it adds additional hoops for them to jump through. If something were to happen to you and you have them listed as the beneficiary with their maiden name, or maybe they, they get married, you're updating it. They get divorced. It just, it, it creates additional issues on the back end that were not intended. You kind of, you said it earlier, it's the unintended consequences of just right. not, not updating things regularly. Um, where again, we build that into our process. We review the beneficiary designations on a regular basis. We do that through the planning process, but oftentimes it's, you know, it's the set it and forget it uh, kind of mentality, right? If I know what my beneficiaries are, I'll, I'll set them on day one and we're, we're good in, in perpetuity when that may not necessarily be the case, especially if you think you retire at 65 and you live till 95, a lot can change in those 30 <laughs> years that no you would want to make sure is reflected, um, you yep. know, in again, account titling and beneficiary designations. Well said. Great. I don't know what else, what else is on your <laughs> list of things to, to really think about if you're trying to answer that question, should I do it myself or not? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything new. It, it really just is, um, it, I think it can be overwhelming once you start to throw out kind of all these little details, all the little things that, that often get overlooked. Um, I could see why we have jobs and that other you know financial advisors exist to help relieve some of that weight of all of those little decisions. But ultimately, I think you said it earlier, um, as long as you have a process to follow, I think that is a key ingredient in, in that decision. Um, if you can execute on a process and you have the checklist to make sure you're not missing those little items, then yes, I think clearly we believe investing is, is fairly fundamental, at least the way that we right. invest for clients is, right. is pretty fundamental. Um, but discipline and a process goes a long way. Yeah, I'm glad you put it that way because I was gonna say, say something similar, right? We, we believe that it is a very fundamental process, but at the same point, um, service matters. And I, I yeah. think this still is a service-based industry if a lot of those things feel like they would be too much for somebody or I feel like I don't have the time to manage that effectively, or I yeah. feel like I don't have the education or I'm not plugged in, like you said, to certain rule changes. So yeah, the point is it's an, it's a really important decision. We're here to coach people through either way, but yeah, there is a reason I think why many of our clients look at us as planners, but then go help me then execute on that plan. And we're here to yes. do that, but yes. um, that's not to say that's for everyone. So yeah, yeah. hopefully that was helpful. Agreed. Appreciate your input, as always. Likewise. Catch you next time around. Bye.
All right. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. Adam and I really appreciate you tuning in. Please note that the opinions we voiced in the show are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be most appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, your accountant, and financial advisor or tax advisor prior to making any decisions or investing. Thanks for listening.